John 14, starting at verse 6. And we're going to read that verse, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to read some more verses. And, and God's going God's to reveal some things to us, and God's going to touch our lives, and we're going to leave here changed in Jesus' name. And so verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Lord Jesus, we love you tonight, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for each person here and online. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. And so tonight, I want to, I, I, I want to address some things that may, may be happening in your life, the, some of the facts of life that may have, may have slapped some of us in the face. You know, it's hard for me. I, I came into this message. This is actually a great week for me. You know, usually when I, when I plan to talk about uh, a, a topic that may be negative, I, I, I'm scared to, to preach on that topic because sometimes you end up living what you, what you preach, right? But this has just been such an awesome week. Uh, Monday, I got to go to the wedding of one of my dearest friends that I've been friends with since 1981, and he had lost his wife a few years ago, and he has found happiness again with his new bride, and, and that was such an exciting time, Monday night. And then tonight, where's my bride? Tonight is our, today is our 37th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Woohoo! Amen. Amen. And that, that is, that hand of, that, that, that is for Melody for putting up with me all of these years. That's why I, I'm not fooled. I know who you're clapping for. Amen. And so she, she, she told someone, I believe, that we were, we were celebrating what it was, maybe our, uh, is it 74th wedding anniversary? 37 for me, 37 for her. <laughs> I don't know if maybe it felt like that. And then, and then, and then as of today, I'm a new pawpaw again, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> So, so this is just a great week for me. So, so this is a tough message for me to preach. But back where we were, I just wanted to, I just wanted to share that with you. It's a funny thing how we, we want to share, you know. But at the same time, I know there are folks here that have been hit with some of the cold, hard facts of life. There's some of you that is experienced experienced sickness, either for yourself or your family members. You've experienced the death of a loved one. You've, you've experienced financial difficulties. And these are just facts. So I, I don't want you to think that, that I'm oblivious to the facts when we start talking about the goodness of God and what he can do in your life. But then I remember this old song from years ago that said, if I never had a problem, how would I know that Jesus could solve them? And so the facts of life are there facing us day by day. And each of us understands what these facts entail. As a matter of fact, even one of our small groups coming up is to do with grief. My, my darling Melody is going to be hosting a group called Grief Share for those who have lost a loved one to, to work their way through their grief. So I understand what the facts of life are that we face. And at, at times when we become too happy, you always got that friend in the crowd. You know, you ever read the book of Job? He had three buddies that came down and told him everything he must have done wrong. Friends like that, right? You have that friend that says, every time you start being positive and start talking about all the good things God's doing, well, you know, you just need to just face the facts.
Let me share what, what I believe. I believe that just because it's fact doesn't mean necessarily that it's the truth. Just because it's fact doesn't mean it's truth. So tonight we're going to talk about the title, Fact or Truth? You see, you can believe whichever you choose to believe. You can believe the facts. You can settle with the facts. Or you can believe the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? You can choose to believe the facts or you can choose to believe the truth. And the facts, when faced with the truth, are no match. You see, the facts limit us, but the truth liberates us. I remember reading years ago, and I, I've told this story, and, and my, my children tell me that I repeat stories all of the time, so if you've heard this, just, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm a senior citizen now, so I can get away with that, but the way you train a flea, how many know how to train a flea? Didn't know you could train a flea, right? You can actually train a flea to only jump to a predetermined height. And what you do, you put the flea in a jar, and you put a lid on the jar. And the flea doesn't understand the lid. So he will jump, and he'll bump his little head on the lid. It's like, this is not right. So he'll jump again, and he'll hit his head on the lid. And, you know, after a while, he gets a headache, right? So what's he do? He says, well, apparently I can't jump that high. So he'll jump just short of the lid. And when you quit hearing the, the flea go tick, 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 as it hits the lid, and you see him jumping, then you can go ahead and take the lid off. Because now the flea has been trained that he can only jump to a certain height, even though he still has the physical ability to jump just as high as he ever could. And sometimes the events of life and the circumstances of this world will hit us so hard that we will be we, we will hit our little heads every time we try to move forward in our walk with God, every time we try to go to that next level, and we become just like that flea, and we say, oh, I can't jump that high. I'm just going to have to face the facts, and the facts tell me that I can't do that, and the facts tell me I can't go any further than this. Let me introduce you to the truth. Hallelujah. The truth is that you can jump just as high as Jesus says you can jump. Amen? They have learned to train an elephant so that you can tie that elephant up with a very small rope. And you can, you can stake him out. And he will go to the end of that rope and he will go no further. Because when he was small, they chained him up with a big chain, and they staked him out, and he pulled and he tugged against that chain until he could pull and tug no further, and he gave up. And once he decided, that when he began to feel the resistance, that that was as far as he could go, he was trained, and now they can put a small rope or small chain in stake him out no matter how big he grows no matter how strong he becomes you can stake him out and he will not break the rope and that's again what the enemy has done in your life and in my life oftentimes and I'm going to tell you the fact is no match for the truth so tonight what are we going to believe are we going to believe the facts or are we going to believe the truth I've walked into many a hospital room and I walk in and and I've been told by the the family or the by the patient here's what here's what the diagnosis is and and I'm sure it's very difficult the more educated you are it's it's more difficult to have faith because you understand the likelihood of recovery from some of these serious illnesses but the doctors told me and they've run the test and, and I'm terminal or, or there's no cure for this and, is, and there's no hope. And that's the facts. And I never dispute those facts. And I never stop that family from telling me the facts because this is what they've been told. And it is true. The doctor's not making that stuff up. The doctor's not mean. He's not the bad guy. 
He's just reporting what he's observed, whether through, through his physical exam or through the tests that have been run. And here are the facts, and these facts limit us so much. But in walks truth. How can, how can I be healed of cancer? How can I be healed of this brain aneurysm? How can I be healed of this heart attack? How, how, can, you know, uh, how, uh, how can someone who's, whose heart is, is totally destroyed and they're waiting for a transplant and trying to keep this person alive until the trans... How can, how can they just all of a sudden regain consciousness and, and go home and be perfectly fine? How can someone who's diagnosed with cancer that's, that's drugged their physical body down to the point that they can't even receive the, the chemo or the radiation and a word be spoken over that person and the next day they're home doing fine? How can someone who's brain dead and there's no hope and they're just waiting for the family to agree to unplug the machinery Someone's come in and say, Lord, touch this person and heal their body. And they walk out of the hospital and live a normal life. How can these things happen? The same way that a God stepped out into nowhere, looked at nothing, and spoke into existence everything. How can we doubt the truth even in the face of the facts? The facts are real. I don't blame you for being afraid. I'm not throwing anything negative your way if, if you've been faced with the facts and, and, and you've been that person that's in fear. But I want to speak hope to you that the final answer doesn't lie in the facts. The final answer is when what God says is going to happen. That's what's going to happen. Amen. And when God does that miracle in your life, he doesn't do it just so you feel good. He doesn't do it just for your benefit. He does it to point people to Jesus. He does it to point people to himself. Amen? It's, the miracle's not the final result, is what I'm saying. And I'm encouraging you, don't be limited by your circumstances. Well, there's that person that says, well, uh, that's, that's good, but I, I'm just, I'm a realist. I, I'm just a realist. That's, that's all. Well, let me ask you if you're a realist. What is more real? The current circumstances or what Jesus says is real? I mean, he's the one that that, like I said, spoke this whole thing into existence, right? What is more real? What we can't keep or what we can't lose? Now, when I go pray for someone, to, my, my, my choice is for them to be healed in their body. And thank God we've seen so many miracles take place in this church. We've seen so many families touched by God in their body. But then we've seen some families where that family member went on to be with Jesus. And so in the first case, we received a miracle to prolong and hold on to for a while what we can't keep anyway. But in some of the miracles, we saw that person promoted on to gain what they can never, ever lose. Amen. So what's real? The problem or Jesus? You see, sometimes our problem seems so real to us. Sometimes our problem seems like it's all-encompassing. Now, I already mentioned I have my phone up here to see you know, who's giving me some love. But let's just, let's just say this phone is the problem. And maybe there's a message there because sometimes 
we allow things to become the problem, right? But whatever your problem is, you fill in the blank. Whatever it is that you're facing today, that's your problem. And maybe your problem, I'm going to go ahead and turn it off so that I'm not distracted by Because there's so many people giving me love, right? You see, the problem is we're closer to our problem oftentimes than we are to Jesus. Because our problem is all-encompassing. And the illustration I'd like to to give, and you're just going to have to picture that you're looking at this through my eyes. Can you do that for a moment? Let's just say that that organ is going to represent Jesus. And this phone is going to represent my problem. Which one's bigger, my phone or the organ? Uh, The organ, okay. And so I can see the organ clearly, but boy, that phone looks pretty big because it's close to me. And then what happens, we focus so much on that problem that we allow that problem to come between us and Jesus. And the closer it comes to us, you see, after a while, this phone has covered both of my eyes, right? And so I can't see at this point the organ at all. And that's what we do with our problem. We allow it to get between us and the Lord and our relationship with God. And we become so entangled and enthralled in those facts, in that issue, in that problem, in that temporary thing that is so all-encompassing that it blocks our vision of the Lord. And we can't comprehend how much bigger and more powerful he is than that thing that we face. Does that make sense? And one other, one other scripture I wanted us to, to talk about for just a moment. And then we're going to look back at John 14. In one place, the word says... Jesus speaking says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And we get excited about that, but we talk about how the devil's coming against us and all the forces of hell are coming against us. And sometimes it does feel that way, but that's not at all what that scripture is talking about. So let me talk about truth for a moment. He was referring to, when he talks about gates, he was, he was making a comparison to the old walled cities of old. And whenever a city came under siege, the, the army that was invading, the last stand for the city was the gates. And whenever those gates were breached, whenever a battering ram was brought on the scene, and eventually those gates were broken down, then the city would soon fall. Jesus wasn't talking about us being on the defense. He was talking about us being on the offense. When he said the gates of hell shall not prevail, he's saying you are coming against the forces of hell. Not that the forces of hell are coming against you. And so this church, the church worldwide, as we point people to Jesus, there are many people that are heading headlong into an eternity without God. Our job is to come against. Our job is to beseech the forces of hell, the gates of hell, if you will. And so when we look at this thing in perspective, it's not, oh, poor me, I'm barely holding on while the enemy is attacking me. And you may face times that you feel that way because sometimes we've been like the flea. Sometimes we've been like the elephant. But I want to share enough truth with you for you to know it's time for the church to go on the offense. It's time for us to realize that God has given us the power to overcome, not just in our lives, but to snatch souls from the pit of hell. I don't know. That was kind of weak. I'm not sure how many people believe that. (laughs) Amen. Well, maybe as we go forward, 
maybe as we go forward, we'll, we'll, we'll get a little more strong on that. And so, what is happening in John chapter 14? I'm going to start all the way back at verse 1. Jesus started off what he was saying by giving a little comfort to his disciples. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you so. I, I go to prepare a place for you. And so, Jesus had already expressed himself as being God in flesh at this point. He said, you, you already believe in God, so just go ahead and continue to believe in me. Now, he says, in my, my Father's house, there's many mansions. Now, you know, there are different translations, use different words beside mansions. But anyway, there's plenty of room in the place where God is. There's plenty of room in the kingdom of God. Amen? But then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm reminded of a verse of scripture that says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And I, th I think about this truth. God created heaven and earth in six days. And this is such a beautiful place. There's such majesty. And if you haven't had the opportunity to travel and see some of the different areas of this world, even, even where you can drive in your car, it, it, this world is just so magnificent. God did that in six days. Now, if I'm understanding history correct, this was spoken 2,000, a little over 2,000 years ago. And he said he was going to prepare a place for us. If he made this world in six days, what has he done in 2,000 years? And we think today's problem is an issue? We think even the worst things that can happen to us are an issue when we have this opportunity to spend eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in a place that's so great that no matter how we try to describe it, we can never even scrape the surface. Amen? He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and, it, and I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go and the way you know, and Thomas, now Thomas, you know, we know him for one statement that he made in his whole life. And, and the poor guy gets called the doubter. Not, never mind, he was a, a, a disciple of the Lord and, and did all kind of great things with, uh, in the kingdom of God. But Thomas, he said unto him, Lord, we know not whether you go. We, we, we don't, how can we know the way? Now I'm going to put that in my vernacular, okay? The Lord's telling him, I'm going. You, you, you already understand. I've already taught you this. And Thomas looks at him and he says, man, we don't know nothing. So Jesus said, you know, he said, I don't know the way. Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so you may know the facts, but Jesus is the truth. Amen? Now, when he said that, he used the phrase, I am. I am the way. And I began to look that up. Of course, the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew originally. None of it was written in English. So that's why it's so funny when we start, you know, kind of kind of stressing over which English translation we should put the most uh, confidence in. And none of the Bible was originally written in English. So that's kind of cool. It, you know, that's another topic for another day. But I, I look back in Exodus 3 where God told Moses, I am. And I wanted to read that for a moment. Verse 10 says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee to Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And I want to stop right there for a moment. See, Moses was asking the wrong question. God called him, and he says, Well, who am I? See, that's one of the problems with folks that are nervous about maybe standing up here and 
preaching? Because you see, it don't matter who I am. Maybe if you're a singer and you get nervous about singing, it don't matter who you are. If you're a musician, if you're a greeter, if you're working at the Start Here booth, amen. Whatever you're doing, if you're media, I mean, we got, I, I, I'm going to go back on these young people. I, I didn't even recognize. We have teenagers working up here. We have third generation Pentecostals out of this church operating media and music and a lot of these things tonight. I'm just so, I'm just so awesomized by that. But you see, it don't matter who we are. So Moses says, well, who am I? And so verse 12, God speaking says, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be a token to you that I've sent you that when, when you brought the people out of Egypt, you'll serve God on this mountain. So Moses says, who am I? God totally ignores that, says, I'm going with you. Oh, everybody say, oh, right? The light bulb went off. So Moses said to God, <coughs> let me just summarize. Who are you? You see, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter who we are. What matters is who God is because we're doing his work. Amen. And so then in verse 14, God said to Moses, I am that I am. And I, I, I looked that up. And that word, I am, that phrase, to us, we look at that in its present tense. It's like right now. And that's good. He's what we need right now. But if you look at the full meaning of that word, it's, it's timeless. It works in past tense. It works in present. It works in future. So when that word, that phrase, I am, it was expressing that he is the eternal God. He's the God that was. He's the God that is. He's the God that forever will be. So not only is Jesus walking you through your current circumstances, he's always been with you. He's with you right now. And he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will always be with you. Yes, you're going to go through the circumstances. Yes, you're going to face the situation of life. But God's going to be with you through those situations, through those circumstances. Now, there's another word in there that we've often overlooked. I've read it for years, and I said, well, that's a weird statement, but, but okay. And it says, I am that I am. How can, how can the word that have any revelation to it? Well, I decided to just go ahead and look the word up. The word that is a relative pronoun of every gender or number. You see, it don't matter whether you need something big from God, whether you need something little from him. There is no big or little up beside him because he is all powerful. It don't matter if you're a man. It don't matter if you're a woman. It don't matter who you are or how big your problem. God is there with you through that situation. The word that also refers to whosoever or whatsoever. So whatsoever you need, I am that. Whosoever you need to be with you through this circumstance, I am that. And whatever you're needing tonight, Jesus is that in your life. Now, facts get in your head when you hear the bad news when you've gone through things that are it gets in your head the circumstances of life get in your head and I want to tell you as, as someone who's tried to help others who've allowed things to get in their head I, I can't get it out of your head but if you will allow Jesus, if you will allow the truth to get in your heart and let him fill your heart. Oh, but I already have uh, been filled with the Holy Ghost. But if you will let Jesus continually fill you, he will overflow your heart and flush 
all of that negativity out of your head. You see, I can't, I can't deal with your head, but Jesus can deal with your heart. And that's where the problem always is, is in our heart. When we have Jesus in our heart, he gets those things out of our head. Amen? Amen. Now, the rest of that chapter goes on, and I, and I want you to read that, and, I, and I'm going to just run over it real quick, and the musicians can come. And it, it said in verse number 7, If you'd known me, you'd have known my Father from henceforth. You know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and, it, and, and that'll satisfy us. And Jesus said, Have I been with you all this time, and you haven't known me, Philip? He that's seen me has seen the Father. Do you believe this? You believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The words I speak, I speak to you not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the work in me. Believe me that I am in the Father. The Father's in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And most everybody in here has a good understanding of who Jesus is. But he was explaining that to them. You see, he was the way, the truth, and the life. And that truth will make us free. Amen? And the reason I wanted to read that, because verse 12, he says, He that believes on me, the works I do, and greater works than these shall he do. He goes on and says, Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. He says, If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. He talked about that I am with you, but I will be in you. Just read the rest of the chapter. And so what can we do that was greater than what Jesus did? You see, our job is to point people to Jesus, right? Jesus healed the sick. The Bible says these signs will follow them that believe. It's not a strange thing. You can, why don't we stand? You see, you have the ability to lay hands on the sick. You don't have to call the preacher. You can believe God. The Bible says if you have faith, believe, and you'll receive these things. Jesus raised the dead. But you see, there's one thing that Jesus never did while he was walking on the face of this earth. He never approached a soul that was hungry and hurting and in need of him and laid his hand on their head and prayed for them. And saw them be filled with the Spirit of God. And you have that ability. And you have that power. And as long as the enemy can get in your head and have you focused on being on the defense and all these things that's happening to me. And poor me and pray for me. And I'm not making fun of you if, if you've asked for prayer. By no means. Please don't take it that way. Because we're all there sometimes. But God wants you to receive your miracle. And then he wants you to go on and be that person that's a blessing to someone else. Amen. He wants you to have an external focus. Motivational speakers talk about those who have empowerment in their lives. Have an internal locus or location of control in their lives, that they understand that if it's going to be, it's up to me, that it's my responsibility for my life. If my life is not what I want it to be, it's not my neighbor's fault. It's not somebody else's fault. I can sit back and be a child and blame someone else for all my problems, but you see, the problems in my life's not your fault because it's, it's me. So it's my choice to have an internal locus or location of control, I take responsibility. You know, we want Jesus to take the wheel, but we want to just sit down and take a nap in the passenger seat. We don't want to take responsibility. Amen? But God wants us to take responsibility, not just for our lives, but then he wants us to have an external focus. And when we begin to do this, we will no longer be troubled with all of these facts of life that are bombarding us. But we will have placed our lives in he who is the truth. And now we're no longer following facts, but we're following the truth. And I believe the God that spoke everything into existence can speak into your life 
and then you having been made in his image can speak life into others. Amen? Why don't we for a moment before we leave make our way to the front of the building and just thank him for this wonderful truth that he has placed in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. We love you, Lord. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you could download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.